Hello Grade 10s. Today we are going to learn about some ways to collect data. We are joining three friends who are planning a fundraising concert at their school. This is the first concert they are organizing and they are not sure how to start. They are not even sure which band to invite. As a result, they have decided to ask for help from Louise, who is in the Mindset Studio. Louise has suggested they collect data as a first step. Today we'll look at a variety of data collection techniques including interviews, questionnaires and observations. We'll also be exploring how to find a good sample to suit the data we hope to collect. Let's join the friends as they learn about the different data collection methods. Observation is one way to collect data. This is when you record what you see. For example, you may have noticed that you and your friends are always tired by the last lesson of the day. So you can decide that you want to find out if this is true for the whole class. One way to find out is to watch your class's behavior during the first and last lessons and compare your findings. Surely we could just ask them how they feel during both lessons. Not really. Then you would put ideas about being tired into their heads before you've had a chance to test them. But asking people works well for many other situations. We call this method an interview. Another method is to ask people questions and fill in their replies on a questionnaire. Questionnaires are useful when you want to find out the opinions of a group of people. For example, if you think that your school should have two short breaks a day instead of one long one, you would need to ask others in your school if they support this idea. If enough people like the idea, then you can suggest it to the principal. You may have seen market researchers collecting data this way at shopping centers and on the street. They approach passers-by and ask questions about a product. But an interview is not always necessary. You can hand out questionnaires and let people fill them in for themselves. Then they can be collected from a collection point. This saves time instead of doing hundreds of interviews. Surely if you leave it to them, some of them won't even bother to fill it in. There's always a chance that will happen. So you have to weigh up the time taken with interviews and being sure of getting all the questionnaires back. If you don't think any of the methods we've talked about so far are suitable, another way to collect data is to do some research. You can find information in encyclopedias and books or on the internet. This data is not original as it was collected by someone else. But if you use this method, it's important to say where the information comes from, otherwise you are stealing someone else's work. This type of theft is called plagiarism. But then when will be the best time to do this data collecting? Good question. You would normally use this method to find out about something that has taken several years. For example, you may want to know how maths was taught to 15-year-olds in 1920 and then compare it with the way maths is taught today. It's impossible to observe a classroom in 1920, so we have to use someone else's observations. It's also useful when we are trying to find information about things that are not part of our immediate experience, like things that happen in a place far away from us. For example, the education system of Ghana has improved enormously over the past few years and it would be cheaper to use someone else's research than to travel all the way there. These are just a few ways of collecting data, observation, interviews, questionnaires and research. Now that they have decided how to collect data, the group needs to decide who to collect the data from. It is impossible to ask everyone who will come to the concert, so they will now discuss how to choose a sample. Pay attention to the terminology they use. But for now, you're ready to think about who should answer the questionnaire. Wait a minute. There are over 20,000 people in our community. There's no way we're going to get our questionnaires back in time for the concert. But you don't have to ask everyone. 
For example, we don't need to know which band Mrs. Ngosi likes. She's 65. We need to ask people our age. Exactly. You need to decide who your concert is for. Out of all the people in your town, who is likely to attend? Well, most of the students from our school are going to come, and I'm hoping they're going to bring their friends along. Right. So we can decide that the group you want to collect data from are the students from your school. In data handling, we call them the population for your research. If you give each of them your questionnaire, then you are using a census. For example, Stats SA conducted a census of the whole population of South Africa in 2002. As far as possible, their researchers visited every single household in the whole country. Wow, that must have taken forever to collect. Wait, are you saying we need to collect a questionnaire from each person in our school? There's over 800 people. It's going to take forever to collect. Gerard, we don't have to ask everyone, you know. Right. You can save yourself time and resources by selecting a sample from this population. A sample is a smaller group out of the total population. When you collect data from a sample of the population, we call this a survey. Sounds like a great idea. My friends will be more than happy to help us fill in the questionnaires. But that's not going to help. Your friends have similar tastes to you, Gerard. That's an important point, Sigra. It's a good idea to choose a random sample. This is a sample chosen so that every member of the population is equally likely to be a member of the sample. How about we put all the names into a hat and then ask somebody to draw 100 names? Gerard, that will take forever. Writing out 800 names and then asking someone to choose 100. It was only a suggestion. How do we choose our sample group? Perhaps we could get class lists from the office and then choose kids from each class. That way we're asking across the grades. That should work. But let me just point out that this sample is no longer totally random. Your class lists go according to grades, so your sample will have a fair spread of grade 8 to grade 12 learners. But that's what we want. Then we won't have any complaints about us only listening to the matrix. I agree. It does give you a fair mix of grades. I just wanted to point out that this is no longer a totally random sample. In fact, researchers often make these kinds of choices for their sample. Now you need to consider the sample size. This is the number of people in the sample and this depends on the number of people in the population. How many people will you give your questionnaire to? I don't think we should spend a lot of time on this. Will 10 people be enough? 10 people? That wouldn't tell us what the whole school wants. Right. The larger the number of people in a sample, the better. Your school is too big to ask everybody, but you need to find a sample size that gives you a fair sense of the interests of all 800 learners. Well, 50 people be enough. Let's think about that. 50 people would mean that 50 out of 800 are asked. That comes to one person for every 16 in the school. Then 100 people it is. That will be one person out of every eight. Sounds good. And that way we'll get a fair idea of what people like in the school. Very good. Researchers and statisticians say that your sample needs to be between 10 and 20 percent of the population in order to give you significant results. What I mean is, if you want your research to give you useful information, you need to ask between 80 and 160 learners. And I think 100 is an easy number to work with. 100 is quite a lot, but I'm sure we can get some help collecting the questionnaires. But how do we know which 100 people to choose? Well, we could mark off every eighth person on the class list. And by the time we get to the end, we'll have 100 names. OK, I'll go get the class list. It sounds like Gerard, Sigra and Cindy are well on their way to organizing a successful concert. Remember that when you are collecting data, you first need to decide what information is important to have, and then the method that best suits that data. 
your sample needs to be chosen carefully to suit the data you hope to get. That's all for today. Remember to look at the task for this section in the data handling task video. You will also be able to learn more about data handling on our website, www.mindset.co.za forward slash learn. Goodbye.